Well, I'm really, really glad to have in the studio a, a friend of mine who we have literally crossed the pond together, Bob, haven't we? <laughs> oh, we have literally yeah. gone to New York with your previous book. You're back again. Mm -hmm. um, you always seem to find the most incredible people to write about and a Manx connection as well. I mean, this is this is just completely balmy. But there's a gentleman from the... I'm, I, I mean, yeah. I'm doing work for you, but the guy from the Old Man actually came up with the name BBC for the British Broadcasting Company, Company in those yes. days mm -hmm. and has a, lived in what was now the co-op in, in Castletown. Over to you. It's a great story. Frank Gill, as you say, was born in what is now the co-op shop in Castletown at... Uh, uh, in 1866 and at the age of 16 he went across to join United Telephone Company and he worked his way up so by the time he was in his 20s he was in charge of the entire telephone systems for Dublin and the south of Ireland what is now IRA yeah and he then came back in the early 1900s to take up the chief engineer position for what is the uh, predecessor of the British Telecom called the National Telephone Company so in the early 1900s, he was responsible for £650 million pounds worth of expenditure, which today is £1.5 billion. I mean, we've got to put this in context. This is I mean, pre-BBC. Pre-BBC. Like, this is two LOs and all those sorts of things. Oh, yeah. It, this, this is, this is, he was responsible for telephones across the UK. And during his lifetime, Alexander Graham Bell invented, painted the telephone and pre-BBC formulation or formation in 1922, he he was working on uh, what is referred to at the time of, of wireless telephony. Radio wasn't a term widely used in the 1920s, it was wireless telephony, and you didn't listen to radio programmes, you heard, you were a hearer of wireless messages, because the telephone was still the, the initial way to uh, refer to systems so they were messages not programs and when the BBC was formed from the manufacturers in 19, 1922 um, Frank Gill was asked to lead the committee the background to that was the uh, post office controlled all the licenses for broadcasting even the term broadcasting at the time when the BBC was formed was considered a crude term so people actually said oh that's not a very good a name for, for, for the organization the British Broadcasting Company yeah, but, but they stuck to it because the manufacturer had, had chosen it so going back to how that started 38 manufacturers were invited by the post office to go to a meeting and they were told by the postmaster general to come up with an organization or two that would avoid them competing between themselves because the idea was you'd have a licensed radio receiver or wireless receiver and you would have to buy that from the manufacturer they would pay a commission to the the post office and the money earned by these from these wireless set sales would allow the company to broadcast transmit the program so they had to give a tight rain on who made those radios yes so you had to have um, and the process was when the BBC was formed as a British broadcasting company all the radio receivers the wireless receivers yeah. would have a BBC stamp on them and it was not illegal it was not legal to import anything that didn't have a BBC stamp on it so there was no license fee in those days it was just so buy the radio and you paid therefore. Not, not only did you have to pay the company for a BBC approved <laughs> receiver but you had to then pay a license to turn it on Oh, which, was, which was 10 shillings, 50p today. A once only, or was it? Oh, annual. <laughs> wow. It's pretty incredible. I mean, how did you come across this, this story? Frank Gill is an inventor. As you, as you probably gather from my work with William Kennish and other ones, I've been interested in Manx inventors for a long time. I've got a collection now of something like 400 patents going back to the 1790s of, of people who live living or burnt, born on the Isle of Man who in, did, did great and marvellous inventions. Frank Gill... It, his inventions related to telephony and I started to research the guy and the more I got into it he's in a book called New Manx Worthies which was published by um, Manx National Heritage and, and uh, about 10-12 about, uh, years ago but it only covers a brief part of his career and mentions nothing about the BBC so as further I got into it and, and discovered that the Americans in 1900 regu regarded him as the greatest telephone engineer outside America and, and basically the Americans were 
the Bell Telephone Company set up by Alexander Graham Bell and the trade papers there considered Frank Gill in 1900 to be the greatest telephone engineer outside America. Uh, immediately after he'd set up the BBC working with these manufacturers he gave a speech where he said to the, the European telephone organisations you should consider yourselves a single country the size of America. Forget about national borders, work towards peace and communication mm. and he very strongly communicated that. But the actual process of setting the BBC up, uh, getting back to that, the manufacturers were asked to set an organisation or two up that didn't compete amongst themselves. And the two big manufacturers, Marconi and Metropolitan Vickers, who got very strong patents, they didn't want to share these with anybody. And Marconi and Metropolitan Vickers said, you know, we'll, go, we'll have two separate organisations and we'll do, go our own sweet ways and we'll bring the other 38 with us as two partisan groups. Frank didn't accept that. He's, he had a reputation for being an absolute superb chairman and an organiser and a mediator. And one of the records I found said he banged their heads together. This is the chairman of Metropolitan Vickers and the chairman of Marconi yeah. to make sure that they could form a single company. And some of the notes I've put into the book show Frank's objective of having a public service broadcasting organisation. So Frank drove the companies together. And once, as soon as that had been achieved and they'd agreed to the terms of reference for this organisation, he then suggested, and according to his notes, that the BBC have in their archives at Caversham show that the minutes of that meeting indicate that Frank proposed the name, which was completely different from any of the organisations that were actually within that mm. manufacturer's group. And they agreed to it and then went back to the post office and said this is the organisation we're proposing called the British Broadcasting Company and we will we'll run to this together and the, all the factions about patents and costs and income put to one side. So Frank's mediation and, and chairmanship and leadership ensured that the BBC became a single entity which then went on to become the British Broadcasting Corporation mm -hmm. about three years later and, and is then grew on to be the greatest broadcaster and uh, communications company of the 20th century. Sounds like we need a blue plaque down at the co-op in Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a jolly good idea. Yeah. Um, I, th I think his, his input to broadcasting, as it's now called, uh, was, was absolutely staggering. He, immediately after he'd got this agreement, he, he then stood down as committee chairman and went off to America to, to further his career, which then went on because he was knighted 20 years later. Um, so he was more interested in the technology and, and, and the career of, of tele telephony than he was in, in getting, mm -hmm. uh, being recognised for setting this, this organisation up. So uh, the rest of the org the rest of the companies carried on to set that up and then obviously Lord Reith was appointed later on. But the fundamental basis for the BBC is, is solely due to F Frank Gill who right. actually made sure that they worked together in a single so, organisation. So this book is his whole life or just this, this broadcasting it, it covers, part? It covers his life from, from his birth in 1866. His father was an advocate who was very popular, but unfortunately his father passed away when Frank was only three. And he lived right through to uh, 1950 when he was in his 80s. And he was attending a telephone, telephony, uh, telecoms conference in Geneva uh, when the information I managed to track down from his son said that he said to his daughter, I feel tired, I'm going up to bed. And he went up the stairs and passed away at the age of 83. But he was Amazing. working on Let's it. Let's have a look at the, just the car. I know you've got little stickers in here, but I just want to show <laughs> what it looks like and hold it onto that camera there. So um, where and where can we get this? Christmas it's a, time, it, it's, really? a, it's available from uh, Bridge Bookshops in Port Heron and Ramsey and uh, Lexicon in uh, Strand Street in Douglas. And it's also available directly uh, online. It's uh, Lily Publications. From, from Lily Publications yeah. in Ramsey. Are you do any signings? Sorry? You can do any signings? Oh yes, I've, um, I've got the invitation out to the bookshops if they'd like me to go along. I'm more than happy to Bob, do so. Bob, it's just honestly, you, you do this incredible <laughs> amount of work. What drives you to do these things? It's, it's discovering the information that's been tucked away and it's pulling it all together. Mm. Um, 
I managed to uh, one of the, one of the companies that Frank Gill went on to to run was a company called Creed in Croydon, which is I don't know if you're familiar with Croydon, but as you step yeah. out of the station, you right. see a large set of office blocks. Well, they are on the site of the factories that he used to run, and they made a system called Enigma with Type X, which Not was the British version of the German Enigma machine right, that that Bletchley Park yeah. cracked. Creed made a machine with an extra rotor that was uncrackable because one of them was left. They made 12,000 during the Second World War for communication, secure communications, and it's, it's, it's been something that's been kept, kept quiet uh, for, for obviously decades. Creed made this encryption machine that, that they even had at Dunkirk. The, the, the Type X was abandoned at Dunkirk without its rotors. The rotors were kept by the, 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 the users, the commerce people who came back on the, on the, on the ships, which obviously included steam packet vessels. Those um, Type Xs, uh, the Germans got hold of one and looked at it for three weeks and abandoned it as being uncrackable because they considered their original Enigma mm. to be mm. unbreakable. And this had an extra rotor in, so it was an extra layer of complexity. In modern terms, you, you look at Microsoft, uh, oh yes, it's 256-bit encryption. Type X was 530 in 1940. So, and it's not just a double, that's two to the power of 250 something more times complex. So he, right. he and his company, they didn't invent it, uh, they perfected it. Perfected. So you got another one ready to go? Thinking about another person? Oh, more, more, more Manx inventors. There's a whole host out there. Right. Yeah. Come back soon. Tell us about <laughs> Thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you.